Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Christ and Coffee podcast, bringing the church together one coffee hour conversation at a time. Today, I have my good friend, Pastor Aster, on the program, and we're going to talk about the Anglican church movement. Aster, brother, it's good to see you, man. It's good to see you, Pastor right. It's cool that we are reunited after a, a time in um, New Jersey and New York together. Right. When we were studying and doing an internship. Yeah, it's, it's good to connect again after a, a long time of not seeing each other and, and now being in the same context, same city. Yeah, so we're literally two blocks away. I, church, I serve Church for the Nations uh, in Burbank, and you are the Rick, what's it called? The rector. The rector. Rector of St. David's Anglican Church. In Burbank. In Burbank. Literally two blocks away. Two blocks. Thrown, uh, stones throw away. That's amazing how the Lord brings us together and here over a yeah, cup of coffee. Yeah, surreal. And learning about uh, our time uh, in ministry in similar seasons of life. We met in Pearl River, New York, a few years back. Yes. And I remember at a bar, you told me you felt the calling to become an Anglican. Correct. Back in 2016, 20, yeah, 2016. So, but your background is what? Like, Well, I was, I grew up, I was baptized in the Armenian Catholic Church, the Eastern Rite. Uh, I was in the... Catholic Church for probably early adult, early childhood until I was about 11, 12. Then I stopped going to church. Altogether? Altogether. Okay. Uh, had a bad experience and then refused to go to church and then uh, started to a uh, series of events later on in uh, young adolescence uh, led me to a dark place and uh, eventually went to a, an evangelical camp. Okay. Had... Uh, nothing was really helping deal with some of the inner struggles I was going through and a lot of the burdens I was carrying as a son, as a brother. And uh, so I had nothing to lose, I felt like. And so these evangelicals, really nice evangelical Christians, kept inviting me to church. And eventually I said yes to a camp that they were holding. And uh, I went and I surrendered. I got on my knees and, and I prayed out, cried out to God. And uh, I said, if you exist, touch me. And sure enough, I mean, I asked as a skeptic. And because uh, by that point, I hadn't been in church in 10 years. Right. So um, I was, if you are who you, everyone keeps saying you are, and I'm, all I'm asking you is for you to touch me. And so he touches me. I can't believe it. I surrender my life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so then I begin this journey into ministry. You know, I, that's all I wanted to do, serve the Lord. And his people. So I was. Uh, so I started attending an evangelical church for the better part of the next twelve years, thirteen years, and mostly in an Armenian context. Armenian evangelical context, correct? Great, yeah. and that's how we connected because we were like in seminary around the same time, correct? Serving in that context. Now I'm at a non-denominational, multi-ethnic church. Yes. And now you're an Anglican. What's the word? Re rector. Rector. Wait, what's rector. the difference between a rector and a father and a so a I'm a priest. official title is like your father, Aster. I'm yeah. Father Aster. Uh, I, I kind of miss calling you Pastor Aster. As sure, result, I mean. But I can still can't call you that. Right, because uh, one of the responsibilities I have as the rector is to be the pastor of the church. So the rector is like the lead pastor. Okay. That's, that's... And so one could be a priest, but not necessarily a rector because we have an assistant assistant priests, right, at the church. And uh, but they're not the rector, they're not the lead pastor, if you will, senior pastor. So, so rector is a fancy word for a lead pastor. Correct. And above you is bishop. We have a bishop. And yes. Do you have a pope in your system? No popes. What's uh, like the archbishop? Is there arch or there's an archbishop in the Anglican Communion? He's the uh, first among equals, we say. So he's not a pope, but because of uh, Protestant uh, Anglicanism, uh, the archbishop is the seat. Uh, where uh, a lot of this was launched. And so he's the first of equals, but he doesn't have any sort of jurisdiction, uh, hierarchical jurisdiction over any other bishops. Okay, so it's like... He leads, he uh, he uh, begins meetings, that kind of thing. He does have obviously a lot of clout and weight because okay. he's the Bishop of Canterbury, but again, he's not a Pope-like figure. Okay, so let's, let's go back to history then. So the... The Anglican Church movement started when? Well, that's an interesting question. So Anglicanism 
some people think Anglicanism began began in the 1600s, you know, with King Henry that's, VIII. That's, he wanted divorces from his wife. Well, and, and then he's no, like, no pope. I want my divorce. Who are you to call me? I'm the king. And then the more Anglican of, church started. Is that no, correct? No, no. More of an annulment. Oh, he thought he shouldn't have been married. The bishop at the time, the bishop of Rome, the pope, mm -hmm. should not have uh, married him and his, which was his brother's sister. Uh, sorry, his sorry, not brother's sister. His, <laughs> okay. his brother's wife, widowed wife. His, okay. His brother Arthur, who passed away, she was a virgin. Uh, and so, uh, but because he got married to Catherine of Aragon, this was the woman, uh, who was the daughter of, uh, Queen Ferdinand, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, King Ferdinand, he, she couldn't produce him an, a male heir. And he felt in his, he was very Catholic and Roman Catholic. And he felt that, uh, this was a curse by God because the marriage itself was illegitimate. It should have never taken place. Why? why? Because it's because there's some biblical precedents teaching in Deuteronomy, where he should not have married his widowed wife, uh, his 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 brother's widow. Interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. It's a text off of Deuteronomy. So he his think his thinking was this is theological, and uh, that was but his what, conviction. But was it really? Well, no. I think it was more <laughs> political. Yeah, yeah. He wanted an an, all, an annulment, not a divorce, because he felt like that wedding should have never taken place. And he felt because she wasn't producing him an, an heir to the Tudor dynasty, um, uh, this was God's way of you know punishing him, disciplining him. Didn't he like end up marrying a bunch of wives? He ended up having six wives, and he, he couldn't produce an heir. Uh, no. Now, what's that? He couldn't produce. Eventually, he did. Oh, he did. Okay. Eventually, he did, but through sub subsequent wives uh he eventually had an affair with anne boleyn when he eventually did a divorce uh, un had an annulment because he 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 separated himself from the catholic church because the pope would not Allow give him, him yeah. uh, grant him that annulment uh, i think it was more of a pride thing between the pope don't tell me what i should do yeah, yeah i'm the king you're the pope back and forth yeah so he ended up saying okay well uh, he excommunicated, excommunicated the Roman Catholic Church from the British Isles. That's what he did as as king, uh, King Henry did. But just to go backwards, uh, Christianity well, has been in the British Isles way before. Uh, of course, of course. But uh, just to get a timeline on the, the annulment event, what, what, so what, he is started that before the Protestant Reformation. No, no. This is he started to think about this in 1525. 1525. So you already had the. Continental Reformation take place, okay. Luther in 1517. Uh, so here is 1525. He begins that process, that back and forth with the Pope. He doesn't eventually, he eventually marries Anne Boleyn, the woman okay. that he had an affair with, uh, that produces him uh, a child, which is Elizabeth, though, not, uh, <laughs> not, not, a, a, not male, a male not heir. A male heir. Uh, and that was in 1533. Okay. So then you have, you have that whole saga, but you're saying that the Protestant or like Christianity on the British Isles has been, the there. Isles has been there. Yeah, I mean, there's legend. Like Saint Patrick was, yeah, um, from the Isles, correct? Yeah, he's a, he's a Briton and he was a prisoner and uh, an Irish prisoner, but then he went back to the place that he was a uh, basically a, as a prisoner and he, he converted he, a lot of people. So the, and then like like Roman Catholic Irish has a different flavor than other parts of Catholicism too. Like there's sure. always different flavors what? of big umbrella. So that Entities. was so that was like St. Patrick's 432. Right. I'm so there's that's Celtic Christianity right. as early as the 4th century, but even before him there's legend that say that Joseph of Arimathea, it's a legend, it's not history, yeah, yeah. that he got to the British Isles because the Britain took over, I'm sorry, Rome took over Britain by 44 AD, AD okay. 44. So they've been there and so the idea is the, the legend is that Joseph of Arimathea, who's a tent maker, went out there evangelizing and brought Christianity to the British Isles. And then there's other other stories, like uh, there's a gentleman by the name of um, uh, St. Alban who protected a Christian uh -huh. in his house, right, from the Romans who mm -hmm. were persecuting Christians. He himself was not, but he had mercy and compassion, heard the gospel. He actually dresses up like the one he was protecting in his home and eventually gets martyred. So he's the first martyr in the British Isles. And that's like third or fourth century before even St. Patrick. And so you have Christianity in the British Isles, but, Celtic. Yeah. But it doesn't go under the rule of Rome. 
right. continental. They obviously they're an island, so they there's always a separation. Till this day, I think Britain always likes that separation as an isle. Brexit, like, like yeah, Brexit, like Brexit. Brexit yeah, They've always okay. wanted to be kind of independent to some. And there's degree. literally a, a a a sea in between. There's a sea. Like, yeah. There's a tangible. Totally. Yeah. So then, in eventually, eventually in 597, uh, Augustine of Canterbury, who becomes the first Archbishop of England. Uh, so the current Bishop of Canterbury traces his authority from to there. 597, uh, Pope Gregory the Great. Okay. Sent him as an apostle. He's he's referred to as the apostle to the English people, to okay. the British. Uh, so he he goes there in 597, and from 597, I think officially, I mean, he died in 1603 or 1604, but officially, Br Britain comes under the Roman uh, see, if you will, jurisdiction in 16, 663, something around 663. So you can see since six, so about 1400 years officially you have Christianity institutionalized there in Roman Catholicism. Okay. And then in the Reformation, about a thousand years later, 900 years later, then you have a, a schism, a, a break for political reasons. Okay, so, so let's like, there's the political reasons with the, the annulment, but, but what's happening underneath in the in the country with is like, it's like there's an echo effect happening. Uh, like I know like, uh, John Knox was influenced by Calvin and brought some Presbyterian in, pre Presbyterianism yeah. in Scotland. Was something happening in England during this time too? or Yeah, no. So the, the, the king just wanted to break away because he wanted to have a male heir, right? He's new. Like there isn't a Tudor dynasty that goes back years and years. No, there was the War of Roses, 1455 to 1487. And from that, that was the House of Lancaster and the House of This is York. like Game of Thrones stuff, right? Sorry, I'm yeah. going into this is kind of the minutiae, but basically <laughs> but no, it's interesting because it's like So the Tudor dynasty yeah. is not one of deeply historic in England. So here's a guy, King Henry the Eighth, who wants to make sure that his family uh, and subsequent, you know, offspring and descendants have uh have uh many years in front of them. So he wants a male heir, right? He can't rely on cousins and because he doesn't have the root, the, the rootedness. So there, this right? is like a, this is not just his own legacy. This he's is thinking far. Yeah. He's kingdom. thinking for the dynasty of the Tudor family, okay. right? Because he's a Tudor, Got right? It. That comes out of the Lancaster house of Lancaster eventually. So, um, so eventually uh, he passes away in 1547. Okay. His son, which is, Edward the sixth, which was the son of his third wife, okay. Jane Seymour. Uh, he basically uh, had his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Um, so he eventually had the annulment. She lived on her own, didn't do anything bad to her, but his second, the mistress that he had, Anne Boleyn, he had her beheaded. So the first son he ends up happening, ha ends up happening to have is through, is through Anne Boleyn. Sorry, uh, Jane Seymour, and that's Edward the Sixth. Edward the Sixth was a young boy. He was about maybe seven, I think seven or eight at the time he became king. Okay. But he's so young, he can't lead. Uh, so he's led by a regency, a, a kind of a group in concert working with him, elders essentially, right? And they're very reformed. But there was another figure that at the time of Henry the Eighth, Thomas Cramner. Okay. who was really persuaded by the Reformation in continental Europe, by Luther and Calvin. Uh -huh. So he was really persuaded by that. So even though Henry broke away, he still remained relatively Roman Catholic in its practice, in its worship, right. Right? in its theology, minus the papacy. Got it. Right. He became, uh, this was the act of supremacy. He was the head state of the church, the defender of the faith. Right. Till this day, the queen, now the monarch, is referred to as the defender of the faith and that's right? re in regards to this moment to this moment right now wow it's like charles the third right charles the third right now the yeah. king uh is considered the defender of the faith for uh, the commonwealth of england okay so so uh so, but his his right hand man he needed somebody to help him navigate theologically so he brought in thomas cramner okay who was very very persuaded had an affinity to luther and calvin and that theology of the reformation so, uh, but he didn't want to push that agenda too much because he knew Henry VIII was very much committed to the Roman Catholic beliefs, minus the papacy. So eventually when he dies, 
and eventually his son, uh, uh, his son Edward takes over. Thomas Cranmer leads England theologically. He's the Archbishop now. Right, he's the, he's, he's the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. Well, Edward dies after about six years, so in I think fifteen fifty two he dies, five years, and here comes Queen Mary back to the throne. When I say back, Roman Catholicism comes back. Okay, and th there's a nickname for this one. A Bloody Mary. Okay, that's where it comes from. She reigned for five years, and in five years, she killed about 200 and some, some uh, number of uh, Protestants. Is, is the drink connected to her? That I don't uh, know. Okay. You got to go ask, okay. man. You, okay. uh, um, I don't know. I drink Arnold Palmer's. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> no Bloody Mary. My golf game is <laughs> a little bit better than my blood game, I guess. <laughs> that's <laughs> that makes any sense. But. So, yeah, man. So, it's been this back and forth. So, you had Catholicism. Then you had something like something in between with... Thomas Cramner and uh, with uh, with his son uh, Edward VI, who was there was much more of a Protestant spirit in England at okay. the time because Cramner had more influence. But then when when his son died and Mary came back to the throne, and Mary is the is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, the first wife, right? And she was very Catholic, the first wife, okay. Henry's first wife. So she wanted to get retribution, revenge. Got it. So she really persecuted a lot of the Protestant bishops and priests, uh, pastors, forgive me, at the time. She brought back a lot of the cathedrals and that kind of thing and, and the Roman Catholic doctrine to the and the allegiance to the papacy. Well, her reign only lasted five years. Okay. Then, she then, dies in 1558. Okay. And her sister, who's now the daughter of Anne Boleyn. This is Henry's Second or third wife? Second wife. Second wife. The one that he had an affair with originally. And he beheaded her. He beheaded her. Oh, man. Because she cheated on him too at some point. <laughs> okay. Well, at least that's what he claimed to have her killed, I think. There's, 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 there's always going to be. There's, a dispute. there's always going to be who knows the real truth. So Elizabeth comes in in 1559 and she reigns until 1603. And this is when Anglicanism, this is called the Elizabethan settlement. Okay. So now you have a long period of time, right? About 44 years. So this is where a lot of that stuff is flushed out. This is where Protestant Anglicanism really finds its roots and its longevity and its so stability. It's like a 40-year period. Yeah, because so, you didn't have five years of yeah. Edward and five years of Mary. You have 44 years of Elizabeth now. So what's forming during this 40-year period? Like, is it like what, what, what else besides there's no Pope becomes kind of so an they, Anglican tradition? So they, this is a really good question. So they developed the 39 Articles of Faith, which is kind of a confessional, okay. right? The 39 Articles of what we believed to be true about scripture, about salvation, about the church, about the sacraments, you know, these kinds of very important things that matters. What separates us from Rome, okay. essentially, right? Uh, at the time, because you only had the which, Protestant church which in is, West, I mean, which is what? And the Catholic church. Papacy. Papacy. More authority uh, on scripture the, uh, versus tradition. That, uh, when it comes to, and the main thing is the Eucharist too. That plays a huge role. The not not trans, like the transubstantiation. Trans, they, they reject transubstantiation at that point? They do. Not, they're not, they do. They do reject it. But they, but they're, and but, that's that's in Article twenty eight and twenty nine in the thirty nine Articles. But what distinguishes them from like Luther or Calvin or the other reformers? Well, well in particular, some of the views again, the views on the sacraments, uh, different from the Lutheran view, uh, the role of the episcopate, basically a bishop. Um, uh, more, more of the Calvin view, okay. Uh, well, no, it's well. I could get into that in a little bit, but it, it's a broad tent. Anglicanism has a broad tent of beliefs, right? right? We're not as dogmatic, even though we have that the confession in the Thirty Nine Articles of Faith. But I, I would say today we're more creedal, going back to the creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, exactly the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, Athanasian's Creed, Apollo uh, Creed. No, that's, not that's a Paul Rocky. Creed. That's Rocky Four. Which Sorry. was a not, no. I don't blame you. I love Part Three. Yeah. You know, uh, it's sad that Paulo had to die, but yeah, yeah. you know. But like, I got you. I got okay, you. Okay. So. Sorry, but we for those it. who are serious listeners. Yeah, totally. Um, but here's another thing. Actually, do you mention something? I just remembered it. Look, Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea in 325. You had British popes that attended that, yeah. so you had Christianity in Britain at the time, in right. British Isles. Just, right. I just forgot to mention that. Yeah, that's important. So, so what distinguish? So here's here's what happens. Queen Elizabeth, I love Queen Elizabeth the first. I love her. Forty year, forty four year, year, year reign. She was so wise. She's called the Virgin uh, Queen. Did she Virginia have, is named after her. Did she have kids? She did not. She never married. Okay. Uh, and for the sake of the country, 
And she was for like, other reasons. So she was like the Pope. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, no. no I'm joking. So celibacy was not something that was uh, required anymore. That so, it so was under Mary. Difference. Yeah, like Mary brought back celibacy. Can because bishops get married? Uh, yes, they can. Well, Archbishop Thomas Cramner was okay. married when he was called by uh, Henry VIII. He was already married. He was already married. And so uh, that went away under Mary when she came in. But when Elizabeth took over the throne as the monarch, she, she op again, it was that Protestant view. She was very much pro Protestant, but she didn't allow kind of those Presbyterians from Scotland who had much more of a reform, in particular Calvinistic, because reform doesn't necessarily mean Calvinistic. Not right. necessarily. Well, today it usually leans towards that. It can, it can, yeah. but there's nuance there. Right. So when she, when they were much more influenced by Knox, obviously Calvin, uh, predecessor of Knox. Uh, so they wanted to bring England under that sort of theological, uh, 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 I guess, uh, jurisdiction, their polity. More for like a Presbyterian model from a, Presbyterian a, model. From a bishop model. But Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth kept them at bay, hands distance. Uh, she, she was really, I think for the sake of the country, she brought a lot of uh, balance. And this is where you get the via media, this idea that what are Anglicans? Uh, you know, there's, uh, we're, we have a little bit of some outward expressions of Roman Catholicism. So if you walked into yeah. an Anglican church, if you didn't know any better and you looked at what was taking place in our liturgy and mm -hmm. our prayers, uh, the vestments, you know, everything you see, it looks very like Roman light, Catholic light, right? Yeah. So, 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 but also Protestant. So, via media, the middle what way. Is that? What is what is that? It's a Latin mean? phrase that was coined later on. Okay. Very much later on, but it's basically this via media, the middle way between, let's just say, between Roman Catholicism, uh -huh. right, and Protestantism. Got it. Right. So, we we're not venerating the saints to the point where we're actually asking them to pray for us. I, although there are Anglo-Catholics who might go that far, Anglo-Catholic is another expression within Anglicanism. Because again, like I said, it's the like white if it's, tent. If it's a spectrum. So if like, there's a spectrum, there's high church, yeah. there's low church. High church could be Anglo-Catholic, very much more persuaded to Roman Catholicism right. and some of those outworkings theologically. And then you have low church that are much more evangelical. And it look like a non-denominational Baptist church. <laughs> to, in this yeah. day, yes. Yeah. So, so you have this wide uh, spectrum, right? All under the umbrella of Anglican. Under the umbrella of Anglican. And, and they all like respect the Archbishop of Canterbury, so long as he, but but like more of a symbolic thing, or yeah, he's like a figurehead because of the historicity of that uh, office. Um, but again, um, he again he he holds a lot of the meetings. He's but again, he doesn't have say. He's, he doesn't. There's nothing said ex cathedra from yeah. the magister, magisterium. Right, right. He's not speaking as a mediator between God and us. That kind of thing. To that um, level of the Pope. Okay. No, no. And again, the Pope has probably done that twice. So, so, so this so. sort of under her reign of forty years, this sort of the beginnings of this. Because like I, I've studied abroad in England for a while. And okay. Got a taste of the high church, low church. Yeah. And this culture, uh, it's quite remarkable. So C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Right. Is he was he high church, low church, or is he just? Uh, it's hard to tell, but he was probably like he went to a typical Anglican church. Probably at the time, it was pretty relative. It was like a mid church, mid high church, but but you have like but you have someone like John Wesley later on, seventeen oh one. I think he died in seventeen ninety one, ninety three. So in that time, the Great Revival, the Great Awakenings, John Wesley was more of a low church evangelical Anglican, but he always viewed himself as an Anglican. He wasn't a Methodist. That developed over time right him and his brother charles but he was an anglican through and through yeah. so was c.s lewis but i would say they were probably more persuaded by kind of the low church evangelical spirit like john stott is a modern day who passed away the great right, yeah. scholar uh evangelical uh pastor from all souls in england he was a evangelical anglican so probably he's not going to wear vestments yeah yeah uh, but he still appreciates the depth and the the the, tr the so, theology of Anglicanism. So, how much of this is just like this is just an interesting question I have. Like, yeah, I feel like Amer there's something called American Christianity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much of this is just Christianity just coming out of England? Is it like a similar thing, or it's more nuanced because you have Anglicans globally? Yeah, I mean, look, pro uh, Anglicans view themselves as Protestant. We're the right. largest Protestant denomination in the world. Which really. The Anglican communion is made up of 
Oh, it depends on who you ask, but I would say 78 to 88 million people worldwide. But the ironic and one of the fascinating, remarkable things is the average Anglican today, demographically, is a Nigerian woman. So uh, Anglicanism is worldwide. We have provinces, basically jurisdictions throughout. A country is a province, Nigeria, North America. England, Australia, Canada. Those are provinces. And, and, and all these provinces have high, low? Yeah, they have high, low. But I would say oh. most Anglican churches are mid to high. Mid to high. Right. And which uh, means like weekly communion. Well, well across the board, uh, yes. We should have weekly communion, yeah. which historically we have. It's just there's, there's more modern, relatively new, I would say in the last 10 years, you have low evangelical Anglican churches that might celebrate communion okay. once a month. But historically, and the vast majority till this day, we celebrate the Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist, so, so, every Sunday. So let's let's go through the service, and then we can come back on some modern history of it. So well, what, yeah. what, what does a typical service look like? Okay, so one last thing, though, that's key to know this. To, to, it'll answer this question, okay. too, is after Elizabeth King, came King Henry. Uh, not, sorry, King not, James. King James. King James the first. Oh, this is the King James Bible guy? King James Bible guy. Oh, this is the guy talking about the King James the, Bible. The, the authorized Bible, which what it was originally said, uh, called, referred to, 1611. But he came in in 1604, and the genius behind King James was, again, there was a lot of debate. The Calvinists at the time wanted England to form this uh, very more staunch Calvinistic, robust Calvinism in its theology and in its polity. But he, the genius of him is he preoccupied a lot of those Calvinists and a lot of the kind of Arminian, if you will, uh, worked on a project. So they're more preoccupied with that, which was the authorized Bible, the King James, Bi uh, King James Bible, right? 1611. And he reigned until 1625, and then his son, Charles I, and it goes on. But he was another st uh, stable monarch. Because Again, here's the scripture in our own language, which, which, which in yeah. a nutshell is the English the vernacular. E the ethos of a Protestant movement is getting the scriptures in the vernacular to the people. Yeah, and I brought this up because you said America. Well, all our Bibles, our English Bibles, translations, are coming from, at least for the majority of time they did, from the King James Version. Beautiful. It's very Shakespearean. This is what happened during the Elizabethan settlement, right? Uh, one could even, I think some have even argued, some scholars have argued that uh, Shakespeare was invited by King James to help in the the making, the addition of the King James Version. So Shakespeare is contemporary with King James Bible. I, I mean, there are some scholars who make that case. Okay. So you see the prose and the beauty so, of that so language. Isn't like Romeo and Juliet, like Catholic versus Protestant, uh, but he's writing about... Italy, yeah, it is. Again, it's like contextual. Contextualizing yeah. a lot of... Yeah, so the beauty of that language uh, comes out of Anglicanism. Most of our ceremonies, I'll go through the question you're asking now too, is... A lot of our, whether it's baptismal or stuff you see in the movies about weddings. Will you take this wife yeah. to be your, you know, so for love? Where does that come from? That liturgy, that language comes from Anglicanism. Right. So, which is any English speaking church has a legacy to what we're talking about. Yeah. And look, and before all of this was John Wycliffe. And I think it was 1381. He but was like the morning the, star. The proto reformer. Yeah. Trying to get the Bible in English. And, and then by the time King James comes in, yeah. in 1604, there was two Bibles at the time, the Great Bible and the English Bible. And, but they were really, they were still really in its infancy, infancy stage as far as its, its, its depth, right? Its accuracy. And so he puts together this um, group of scholars to produce something that became really what missionaries w went to the four ends of the world with the King James Bible. So yeah. the beauty of it historically, too, that uh, it's its place in history. Again, a lot of this comes from Anglicanism. And so the beauty of Anglicanism, when you come to a worship service, a regular Sunday, Euchar we call it a, a Holy Eucharist, right? Uh, the Holy Eucharist, Eucharist re referencing the, the Lord's Supper. Thanksgiving, Eucharisto, from the Greek. That's the central piece of our worship service. Right? So that's like a, where it's like everything is leading to that. Even in a low church, everything is leading to that high water mark, right, of the Holy Eucharist because of our uh, our theological understanding of it. Now, the there's our services are broken down into two main parts. The liturgy of the word, 
the liturgy of the Holy Table, of Holy Communion. They call it a table versus an altar. Well, the very again, it could be it go back depending on if you hear the word table, probably a little bit more low, uh -huh. right? Like as a Protestant would like to use the word table instead yeah. of altar, yeah, right. But you have churches that might reference that at the altar, or or they do a, a altar table thing. Oh uh, yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah. you, then you're confusing everybody. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you're, you're instead of the segment of your population. So, but I love it, you know. So. Um, so for me, it was it was a lot of this that attracted me to Anglicanism. So that goes back to my stories your, because your Catholic roots. Yeah, because look, as a cat, I, I was I was I grew up in the Catholic Church, Armenian Catholic, and you're also Catholic. born in Nigeria, by the way. Yeah, which so is interesting. I, which is also interesting because you're of the saying, Anglican connection, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And at the time, obviously, I didn't know I had no yeah. clue of that reality. So then I became an evangelical. God touches me. I, I surrender. I follow. I love yeah. Jesus. And the emphasis of being an evangelical, sharing your faith, you know, this outward missional aspect, right? I love that part of, you know, the, 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 the aspect of a personal relationship with uh, the Savior, the Son of God uh, of the world, right? So, um, but then I realized uh, I was still struggling, though, to pray yeah. and to read scripture regularly but i couldn't admit that i couldn't share that with the public because here's somebody who was studying to be a pastor right and can i let people know could i be so honest about my struggle of praying and reading scripture regularly and i felt like that that would that would disqualify me right and people would lose respect in me and i'd lose cred credibility so I was, I was spiritually bankrupt because I was just going to service on Sunday, getting a lot of God's word, which was great, a lot of emotion too. But then come Monday and Tuesday, I was depleted. I needed to be replenished, but I didn't have the tools. I didn't know where to go. I had to wait another four or five days until Sunday came because okay. I struggled regularly. And this is not everybody, but this was my story. Right. Not everyone could connect in the to worship that part. style of a contemporary worship style. Always. Some people do. And, and for me, for them, it was but... great. But but in my studies, I, I, I noticed something that a lot of the scholars that I really enjoyed reading, right, right like, that I agreed with, and yeah. I just really enjoyed reading. And I come to understand a depth yeah. in, in, in a whole bevy of subjects like apologetics or New Testament studies uh, or theology, systematics. It just so happened that those scholars were Anglican. Right. And it ju I just connected the dots one day. I said, why is it that I like these people so much? Their worldview, the way that they express their Christian faith. What is it about that? There's a common denominator between these people. Their English is impeccable. Yeah. Not only that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't even hear them. This was even before like YouTube, I think. So this was stuff that I was reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think they, they were so balanced. They, they weren't rigid like some hardcore fundamentalist, but then on the other end, like some extremely progressive. So there was just something about, there was a, the, the way that they expressed the Christian faith, I, there was an attraction to it. Yeah, so you, you have scholars like N.T. Wright, J.I. Packer. N.T. Wright, Packer, Packer. Packer. But then guys like, again, C.S. Lewis, Lewis, John Wesley, John Wesley um, in there. Okay. Uh, Alistair McGrath. So some of these folks, right? And uh, so then I started looking into, well, what is it, what is it about them that's common? And, and it's their Anglican faith. And I said, well, interesting, maybe it's their worship that's influencing the way they communicate the Christian faith, right? Maybe something deep that they're intimately, like deeply rooted in, that's shaping and forming them in such a way that allows them to express their Christian faith in this particular way. Right, right. So this mere Christianity. Yeah. Right? And so, so I looked into it and I found out that Anglicans have this thing called the prayer book. The Book of Common Prayer. Which a lot of other traditions also borrow. They borrow yeah. from that. Like a lot of our liturgies are wedding services, baptismal. Yeah. Where do people draw that? At least in the Latin West, they draw from the Book, the of, Book Common. of Common Prayer. That's what That was one of the geniuses of Thomas Cranmer. He's the main art, architect. So from the beginning. 1549 wow. and then Good. in 1552, then eventually in 1559, and eventually after the Civil War in English, the English Civil War in 1662, after the Puritans, they... They lost the battle between the the British, the Anglicans. Uh, they produced the 1662 version of the Book of Common Prayer, and then there's been subsequent versions ever since. So the so Anglicans are people of two books: the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. And and so so I came across the Book of Common Prayer, the 79 version at the time, because this was like 15 years ago. 
And so I use that because uh, this is what, again, so N.T. Wright was probably reading through the Book of Common Prayer in his morning devotionals, morning and evening. So Anglicans have this prayer book and it has eat, morning prayer, the offices, uh, the daily office, we call it. Morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, and compliment. And for me, who was struggling to read scripture and pray, this became such a helpful, uh, it just really saved me, right? Because I had something, some structure, something with texts that and, were assigned. And not, not just on Sunday. With the, not just on Sunday. This was the Monday week. throughout but, the week. But like the Catholics, the Apostolics, the Orthodox, they, they have some similar traditions too in their in their book. But yeah, so do Lutherans. They have the Book of Order. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Presbyterians have the Book of Order. Uh, the Lutherans have the Book of Concord. But other traditions but, have it. But, but it's maybe not as um, part. It doesn't of the, take. It doesn't have such a. I guess again, the, the genius about Thomas Cranmer. He's he wanted to take something that was exclusively for the clergy, right, in Latin, and translate it to the people common language which is as protestant that that whole idea for a common is as protestant person. as it gets right yeah, okay that's very protestant right to allow the people to read scripture to pray yeah. a, a, throughout the week so you you engage in this practice you yeah. respect the authors and then what 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 leads you to make this jump from just like this evangelical structure to to be like all right i'm going to become full ordained yeah because uh well because of the prayer book it, i found some i found a rhythm uh-huh. It helped me. I, I had text assigned and prayers. And I used to think prayer was just extemporaneous, you know, spontaneous prayers. And there's a place for that. Of course, I still do that. But then I found this treasure, this richness of written prayers that go back 1,400 years, yeah. 1,500 years. And even like prayers from John Chrysostom, right, an Eastern father that go, you know, that go so far back. And so this is, it's all of Christendom. And I just love the richness of that, that uh, continuity. This is the church's prayers. This wasn't something that Cranmer just made up no, like in novelty in his yeah. time. He's drawing he's from the church fathers, the from resources. the Eastern church fathers, the Western church fathers, and he's putting together a, a, a set of prayers, midday, morning, evening, all that. And, and the richness of that, because there's times I want to pray things, I want it and told us to do, but I don't have the language for. And now... It was given to me. And that's all. I can own those prayers. But the beauty is that I'm sharing those prayers with other, the saints of the church, both present and, and past. Future. Yeah. And future yeah. that will also adopt this. We call that like the mili church militant on earth and then the church triumphant. triumphant in heaven, right? That have prayed this. And imagine you're God. You're hearing these prayers daily. They're like the same prayers. And you're God hearing this. I just think that's, beautiful and and it and it reads me right see the prayers read me it's almost like a mirror it, it convicts me mm -hmm. it, it it points out things in my nature in my life in my thoughts and stuff so so uh so the prayer book became uh seminal it was it was central to my my sanctification if you will right my maturity if you will mm -hmm. as i was striving to be more like christ and it became a huge tool for me, a blessing. It really saved me. And so I was using the prayer book as a daily devotional. And so uh, even if I was in an evangelical church, non-denom, or I was in a Presbyterian church, I used the prayer book as my daily devotional. But over time, to get to your question is, over time... It just, I fell in love with the history of the Anglican church as I studied more. And yeah, it's and the theology of the um, episcopacy and the priesthood and then the sacraments and also this flexibility within yeah and there's room yeah we're not absolutely. so dogmatic right right there's it's not as rigid right and so it's a wide spectrum uh, 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 there's a huge paradigm we call it a, a, a white tent and 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 so there's room there but then again there's boundaries the rule of faith this is a faith we've received right. and that was another thing that i appreciate about the anglicanism it's like we're not trying to develop something new. Right. This is a faith we've received. Like Christianity didn't come to me in a vacuum. Right. It didn't go from the book of Acts and jump on my and fall on my lap. Right. No, there's been men and women in all of Christendom that have been persecuted to preserve this faith. Right. Right. The rule of faith, orthodoxy, right? The one holy Catholic and apostolic church. When I used to hear that in the evangelical camp, 
I used to think, oh, bad, evil. No, oh, this is too, you know, rigid. I that was my that was the interpretive lens or the ears that I was hearing that. But I learned, no, 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 no. There's there's beauty in that. This is a continuity of the Church of Jesus Christ, the people of right. God. Right, Catholic being universal, lower case Catholic yeah. being missional well, and evangelical. Totally, yeah. and Catholic doesn't mean Roman Catholic. Roman Catholics don't have a monopoly on the word Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Catholic just means uh, of the whole. Right. Right or universal. Right. Right. And apost apostolic. I apostolic mean, is from... the is the testimony of the apostles. Yeah. Right. And so, so uh, and then the, the the belief in the sacraments. Right. You, that that predate the popular view of the the majority view throughout time. And I know this is debated. The view of the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist of the Lord's Supper. What right. does that mean? So as I began to study those things and I started to ask questions, it wasn't something that I just jumped knee jerk reaction impulsively jumped into this new yeah. denomination, this tradition. But I found out that this is a tradition that predates the 1500s, right? And so although I am very much grateful for the reformers, right, and the Church of the Roman Catholic Church needed to be reformed. Right, because of and, its doctrines, its abuse, them, and currently a lot of those reforms happen. It's yeah. uh, there was a lot of views that I, I uh, it, for good reason, it needed to be reformed, right, right? to be protested, right. Uh, but Christianity didn't begin in the 15th century. Right, it begins when it, Jesus starts. Exactly. Yeah. So going back to the early church, and then the church fathers, the patristic age, then yeah. the Middle Ages, then the Reformation. So, so there's a whole history there. That the reformers themselves, Luther and Calvin, had a great affinity, even though they criticized. But again, Augustine they celebrated, right? Or Origen, or Tertullian. Tertullian is the first man who who coins the word Trinity for right. us. Right, and he's a North African. He's a North African. Yeah. And so, so all this that I learned in seminary was now coming together. But I wanted something for my own personal growth, so I can live out the Great Commission. Right. And the great commandment. Ultimately, and, how do I love God and my neighbor? And giving you practical steps to do that. To connect to God daily through the Book of Common Prayer and more of like the a more fleshed out theological structure in your worship style. Amen. I, I want like when we worship God, we're talking about the King of Kings, and I really believe He's present. Right. Like, so do you. And so, if the King of Kings is present in our worship, we should worship Him in beauty. Right. In holiness, right? Not just some abstract idea like holiness. No. If we really believe Christ is present right. in some mysterious way, right? He is present. Then we should offer our... Uh, this is an offering. Worship is a time of offering. That's what it is. But what can we offer God? Well, really only two things. Praise and thanksgiving. There's nothing we can give to Him that He doesn't have or that's really uh, worthy Right, because we're broken, saved by God's grace through faith, right in Christ. And that was one of the great, uh, great, uh, uh, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Contributions, right, of the priesthood of all believers, right, right, uh, in the Reformation. Amen, amen, amen. But this idea of a priest is the human vocation. Adam was a priest. His his. He was a king. You shall have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, you know, every over every living creature. The human vocation was a royal priesthood. Royal priesthood of all Adam believers. was the first king and priest. The words that uh, to to work the land, to tend the garden is abad and shomer, which are the same words uh, sh abad is used for the uh, to describe the Le 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 Leviticus priest. In the book of Leviticus, Le Leviticus, and their uh, their service in the temple, okay, in the tabernacle, then temple. So that language there is used to describe Adam's vocation, right? Right. So that's where we get this idea. So this priesthood is not just something that the institutional church in the third or fourth century after Nicaea. Uh, as Christianity eventually became uh, institutionalized uh, with uh, eventually with the Edict of Milan, later on with Ambrose, and uh, it, later in the 4th century. No, this is the human vocation. And our we're worshiping God in our worship service, right? So we are offering, making an offering, giving the world back to Him. So there's a lot of theology there right. that needs to be reclaimed. So whether you're a formal priest or informal as a layperson, 
We are priests. We are kings and queens in the kingdom of God, hence a royal priesthood. Right? That's what they reclaimed, that they unearthed, that they rediscovered in the Reformation, right? So this language of king and queen in the kingdom of God, which is has come, not in its fullness already, but not yet, yeah, yeah. right? Not in its full capacity, but that Jesus ushered in, it broke in, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so all of these pe all those people, followers of Christ, the church, are now reclaiming that what it means to be human. Right? God gave Adam and Eve this world and said, co-reign with me. Yeah, yeah. Right? Be stewards. But not to abuse. Domin when we hear the word dominion, I get it. There's that tendency of tyrannical, destroy, right, right. conquer, quest, all that. No! It's to tend the garden. Right? To be a good steward. To love. To, to serve. Right? This generosity. Right? That is what Christ, the, who is the, the final Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam, demonstrates to us what it means to be truly human. And so he is what? The high priest, right? He's the high priest of the priests, right? Right. And so we he models for us what it means to be human. This is the beauty of the incarnation. Right. And then... So all of this is being flushed out in our worship service. Right. So we are priests, right? And so we are worshiping God, offering him praise and thanksgiving. That's what the Holy Eucharist means. Thanksgiving. Right, And so we as sinners, right, broken, right, but redeemed by the blood of Christ, right, by grace through faith, right, this is, the, this, is the, this is the reckless love of God. This is his gracious, kind, friendly heart that he extends to us and invites us again to reign with him. Because what is the, talk about the book and on the other side, the book of Revelation, when God creates a new heavens and new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes down, and He says that uh, He says that now uh, you will be you will reign with me, right? We'll be co-reigning with Christ. Co-heirs. 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 Where does that come? Co-heirs because of again, it's reclaiming when paradise was lost, right? Right. So the church, what the church is doing on a Sunday, is in the present time. It's doing multiple things, but one of the things it's doing is it's living out the future in the present, right? In the eschaton, in the new heavens and new earth, when we worship Christ, in in that in that in the eschaton of all things, the consummation of all things. And so, what we're doing here is we are enacting, reenacting that in the present of the future. So we're pointing to the future in the present, but also what's happening in heaven in the present. Right, in that realm we call heaven, where the, the saints of God who've gone before us, right, the church triumphant, uh, is worshiping God with all of the heavenly hosts, with all the angels, and all of the saints that have come before us. As they worship Christ right now, we're doing that, and we're offering praise, and we're singing with the angels, holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty. Amen. Right? So, so that what we're, that's why there's integrity, and the liturgy, the parts of the service, help shape and form us, whether that's confessing our sin, passing the peace, um, acknowledging our, uh, again, acknowledging our sin, but then listening to God's word, uh, asking the word to purify us, you know, standing on holy ground. So they're, all of the parts of the service, they're not just rote ritual for the sake of ritual, which it can be. I understand that. It's like a skeleton. But what you need is the spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. we're, we're three streams. Catholic, uh, as Anglicans, three streams Anglican. -y. We are Catholic. We are charismatic. And we're also evangelical. Right. right? But so we're, we believe in the, 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 the sacraments. We believe in the, uh, the spirit. But we also believe in the, the, the scriptures. Right. So, so, um, and you bring it all together. We bring it all service, together. And, it, and it's this beautiful unity of uh, seeing the church service as this moment of connecting with not just the current moment, but like all church universal. Yeah. Uh, the, being this royal priesthood. This royal honoring priesthood. the king of kings. Right. Uh, honoring, being grateful for what the high priest accomplished for us with the Eucharist. Right. And invites us and invite, now. And inviting us to engage in that now and forever. For the sake of others. Because at the end, we have a dismissal. 
yeah. right? The deacon will dismiss the people, but the liturgy doesn't end at the dismissal. Now that we've encountered God, we've been uh, uh, we've been uh, nourished by His table, equipped by His Word. We go out now into the world. The liturgy continues because go forth, uh, go forth, and you're, become you're part of a royal priesthood, faithful witnesses of Christ. You witness, which is a prophetic. Language. Yeah, so we're, we take this with us. So the, the the our holy Eucharistic service, right, prepares us to go out to be disciples, right, to right. be the hands and feet of Christ, not just the mouthpiece, right. We embody, and that's the beauty of the worship service. We embody our faith. We yeah. bring all of our senses, our our smell, our taste, yeah. our eyes, our ears. Uh, we bring all of our body because when we worship, we should bring our whole bodies to worship. The incarnation is a reminder that the body matters. Right, right. We're not docetists. We're not, um, we're not, uh, uh, what's the word, the great heresy in the first centuries, uh, Gnosticism, right? We believe God calls the, the physical world good. Even after sin, he still thought it was worth saving, hence the redemption and the incarnation. So the body is good. The physical, even though it's tainted, it's marred with sin, the physical world, God is going to make a new heavens and new earth. Yes. But we take our bodies and worship. Absolutely. And, Jesus and, resurrected and, with his body. Right. And we right? need to have practices that engage the body. So, so that fullness, that robust so, so. understanding in our worship service helps me and the people of God, the corporate worship. And that's another beauty. It's not just me preaching a sermon for 25, 30, 40 minutes. And, and there's like everybody's participating in the worship service. So the people of God, yeah. where lay people or clergy, we're being equipped, we're being sent out for the great commission to love God and neighbor and the great, sorry, the great commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself, the great commandment. And then the great commission to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the, I needed the order as Paul talks about our worship should be yeah, in yeah. order. So I needed that order, that structure from Monday through Saturday. And then on Sunday, corporately as we worship, so then I can live out those twofold, uh, you know, instructions, if you will, by God. Loving his... God and making disciples. Amen. Amen to that, brother. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to more conversations, and I'm glad we're neighbors again. Yes. I love it. All right, my uh, friends. Thanks for listening to the Christ and Coffee podcast. Stay caffeinated, my friends, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Christ and